Good evening. Welcome to Louisville Presbyterian Theological Seminary's Grawlmeyer Lecture in Religion. Charlie Grawlmeyer loved the University of Louisville. Uh, by the way, Jim Ramsey's here smiling when I say that. Wave at us, president of University of Louisville. Charlie Grawlmeyer loved Louisville Seminary. He served on the board of both schools. Charlie loved the church. And Charlie Grawlmeyer loved big ideas. And he believed in them. Since 1990, Louisville Presbyterian Theological Seminary and the University of Louisville have recognized scholars from around the world who have lived out Charlie's vision that big ideas can change the world. Charles Grawlmeyer was a person of remarkable vision who thought, and this is a quote, that great ideas should be understandable to someone with general knowledge and not the private treasure of academics. It is in this spirit that Charlie established the award in religion as well as awards in music composition, ideas for improving world order, education, and psychology. These awards serve as Charlie's mechanism for encouraging great achievement. The ideas that our Grawlmeyer Religion Award winners share challenge us to take a deeper look into what we as people of God believe to be true about ourselves and the world in which we live. And so it is with remarkable, and tremendous care and respect that Grawlmeyer Award winners are considered and selected. Tonight we will hear from someone who is worthy to be included among those others who have been recognized. Scholars like Ibu Patel, Jonathan Sachs, Diana Eck. And so I would like to invite Shannon Crago Snell, Louisville Seminary's Professor of Theology and Faculty Director of the Grawlmeyer Award in Religion to come and introduce to you our 2015 Grawlmeyer Award winner in religion. Shannon. Good evening. Thank you so much for coming out tonight to this special event. The first thing I want to do is invite you to a reception and a book signing that will be held immediately after the lecture across the way in the Wind Center. There will be tea and coffee, sweets and snacks, and copies of Reverend Dr. Jennings' book will be available for purchase. It is a true joy to introduce the Reverend Dr. Willie James Jennings. Dr. Jennings is a native of Grand Rapids, Michigan. He received his BA from Calvin College, where he was president of the Black Student Union. He earned his MDiv at Fuller Theological and his PhD at Duke University. An ordained Baptist minister, Dr. Jennings is Associate Professor of Theology and Black Church Studies at Duke Divinity School. Tonight we honor Dr. Jennings for ideas in his book, The Christian Imagination, Theology and the Origins of Race. The book addresses a fundamental disconnect in Christianity. Although believers affirm that Christianity is about love, this religion is deeply implicated in racial oppression throughout centuries and across continents. We are still, as a nation and a world, in the grip of racial oppression and violence. In the Christian imagination, Jennings attempts to diagnose what has gone wrong in Christianity and to envision a new way forward. Now in the first part of the book, Dr. Jennings does something that he explains a concept that's now commonly taught in colleges, but 15, 20 years ago was not, namely the social construction of race. 
People have always come in different shades of skin, but it was not until the beginning of the colonial period that groups of people were categorized as belonging to different races. This categorization took place within and largely because of the colonial enterprise and the beginnings of intercontinental slavery. The very notion of race came to be within the context of conquest, domination, and enslavement. Now, while a number of authors have described how race was developed as a conceptual tool, Jennings adds two crucial elements. First, he highlights the role of displacement. It was only when large groups of people moved from one place to another, across countries and continents, that it became possible and useful to identify them not primarily on the basis of where they come from, of the land, of their geographical and family ties, but of skin color. As people moved, some voluntarily and many forcibly, Identity was no longer determined by where a person lived, but by what a person looked like, black, white, yellow, or red. In Jennings' words, without place as the articulator of identity, human skin was asked to fly solo and speak for itself. The other aspect that Jennings' analysis adds is the role of Christianity in this process. For many of the colonizers, Christianity provided a motive, or at least rhetorical cover, for the destruction of landscapes and indigenous cultures, as well as the enslavement of people. As much as I hate to acknowledge it, Christianity was in on the ground floor of the development of race as a way of understanding and organizing humanity and it was the possession and tool of those recently understood as white. Christianity could provide this justification for conquest because of a different form of displacement. Dr. Jennings examines how European Christians during the time of colonialism remapped biblical stories of salvation and redemption onto their native land. Translations of the Bible changed place names in Israel and Judah, along with the names of Jewish kings, to the names of British places and British kings. Britain, and later America, saw themselves as the New Jerusalem. While Christians had been the Gentile others to the Jewish people, they recast themselves as the true chosen ones. As people were displaced, displaced from their geographical origins and given racial identities, Christianity was also displaced from its Middle Eastern roots, its Gentile heritage, and it claimed for itself the status of the new and true elect. There's a lot more in this intricate text as Jennings interweaves different disciplinary methods and perspectives to untangle the relationship between Christianity and racial oppression. He does this in the hopes of seeing a new way forward. Perhaps, he suggests, reimagining Christian identity in relationship to Judaism might be vital in hearing current, healing current racial tensions between blacks and whites in America. Perhaps, he continues, Christianity must attend to place, to space, to the land we inhabit in order to become a religion of love that can unite rather than divide. This book, The Christian Imagination, has been met with critical acclaim, including winning the American Academy of Religion Best Book Award for Constructive Theology in 2011. In its brilliant flashes of new understanding regarding Christianity and racial oppression, and in its creative potential to foster more just and respectful relations between religions and racial groups, this is a book worthy of the Grawmeyer Award. Reverend Dr. Willie Jennings, will you come forward, please? On behalf of Louisville Presbyterian Theological Seminary and the University of Louisville, I present you with the 2015 Grawmeyer Award in Religion.
Good evening. I am deeply honored and humbled by this award. I could not have imagined in my wildest dreams that others would read this book and see what I was trying to say. You know, when you write, you, you always write in hope that your voice will carry beyond the inner recesses of your mind out to others and that others might see a bit of the architecture of what you're trying to do. And if you are really blessed, they can see where you're trying to go. And so I am so excited that some have seen and have shared in my hope as I write. May I begin by thanking the committee for um, bestowing upon me this tremendous honor. I want to thank the Grawmeyer family for continuing the wonderful legacy of this brilliant man. I want to take a moment to also thank Dr. Shannon Craig O'Snell and the Louisville Seminary community for caring for me and my family, my tribe, as I like to say. So well, there's several of my family here. Some are not present tonight, but I want to thank them for the kindness they have shown to, to me and to my family. And I also want to thank, um, in, uh, as a part of the Louisville community, thank the students especially for their kindness and their enthusiasm. I have been here today and have enjoyed an absolute wonderful time, first of all with my dear colleague, Dr. Craig O'Snell, but also with the faculty, the brilliant faculty of this institution and the absolutely marvelous students. Thank you so very much. And I look forward to the rest of my time. I'm sorry that I'm gonna to have to leave at some point in time. I wish this could go on for a few weeks, but. It is the questions that we wrestle with that define a life. And my life has been defined by questions that moved between Christian faith and race. They were questions birthed in me by the faith birthed in me and questions placed in me by the racial challenges that confronted me the minute I began to hear those voices of this world telling me who I was and who I was not. In my journey as a scholar thus far, there have been three crucial questions that shape my work. They flow through one another and together press on me the urgent task, the urgent task of trying to make sense of both the world of faith and the racial world at the same time. The first question has to do with the church. Can the way Christians imagine church ever witness God's full embrace of humanity and the rest of creation? Christianity has been deeply infected with race. That is, with the racial imagination. For many Christians in this world, especially in America, race shapes who they imagine they belong to and who they wish to include. This is the racial imagination a way of imagining connection and belonging through race. But there is a different way of imagining connection and belonging that is at the heart of Christianity. This different way, rooted in the teachings and life of Jesus, envisions belonging in ways that press against the boundaries and constantly work toward deepening relationships that would be stronger than any family, stronger than any clan or people. 
this different way is a way of radical joining and life together. Yet the reality we face is that racial belonging is stronger and more powerful in its imaginative capacity than Christian belonging. But does it have to be the case? Does that have to be the case? Is there a way to activate among Christians and others a deeper sense of connection and belonging that would issue in a desire to move toward one another? It is this idea of connection that drove me to a second crucial question. Christians, like peoples of many faiths, believe in a God who creates, and that this world in all its complexities, this world is that God's creation. That belief commits us to see all that is in the world as profoundly, irrefutably connected. But why does that commitment do so little work in the way many Christians behave toward others and toward the rest of creation? What work, what work should belief in the world as creation do for how we understand our connection to one another? What seems to be missing or at least blocked in our thinking that hinders us from seeing and living into the connectivity of all things. What seems to be missing? I realized that this blockage had something to do with something else embedded in the racial imagination, and that is geographic separation geographic separation. The racial imagination, thinking race, was somehow connected to segregation, spatial and geographic segregation. There is a relationship, but no one seemed to be able to articulate that relationship. I don't mean that no one was able to explain the reasons for segregated living spaces. I mean that what was not clear to me was why race and segregationalist ways of thinking and living seem to be meant for each other. They seem to give life to one another, race and segregation. It made no sense to me that people who were Christian and trying to think as Christian would be susceptible to segregationist ways of thinking and living. But this problem drove me to yet a third question. What does it mean to think as a Christian, to be a Christian intellectual? I have been trying to understand the precise contours of embodied, embodied Christian intellectual life. What does it mean to think as a Christian on the ground in the real world? Not the world as we would hope it would be, but the world that is. I have always been disappointed with the lack of Christian engagement with ways of life as a way of life. Why have Christians not followed the way of our God who entered into the full reality of humanity and creaturely life by being willing, indeed, indeed eager to enter the lives of people, not our own? How is it that Christians have been formed not to see the expansion of our identities toward those around us as part of what it means to be Christian? These are the questions 
I am wrestling with in the Christian imagination. What is the fundamental thesis of my book? That Christianity in the West, Christians who have been directly or indirectly shaped and or touched by modern colonialism, that is colonialism from the 15th century forward, have inherited a diseased social imagination. The way we imagine connection, belonging, and our obligation to join with other peoples have been deeply distorted and must be rethought from the ground up. This is too big of a story to try to tell in one book. So what I did was I told several smaller stories to show the effects of this diseased social imagination. I asked my readers, and now I ask you, to consider this in three aspects, displacement, Translation and intimacy. Displacement, translation, and intimacy. Displacement, as the word suggests, is something that is out of place, disjointed, maybe even broken at the foundations of Christian identity. Christian belief in God begins with an astounding claim that we have met God in a Jewish man, Jesus of Nazareth, a vagabond rabbi who came not to us, but to his own people, Israel. The us in that sentence is Gentiles, those not of Israel, those simply not Jewish. And by Jewish, I mean, cruelly speaking, all those inside the history of Israel, who would identify themselves theologically, excuse me, or ethnically inside that history. We Gentiles were outsiders, outsiders to Israel. We were at the margins. Somewhere, probably in many places and many times, Gentile Christians literally got tired of remembering that they had come from the margins and that they were included in Israel's promise. They decided, we decided, that those who followed Jesus were the only people of God and that Jewish people, Israel in the flesh, as one biblical writer says, Israel in the flesh was no longer the people of God. We also decided that we should look at the world as though we were at the center of it and not at the margins with a Jewish man named Jesus. We forgot that we were Gentiles, the real heathens, if you will, in fact, many early church writers called Jewish people heathens, called them Gentiles. A Christian world was turned upside down and remade into our image. As early European Christians entered the new worlds we call Africa, the Americas, the Pacific Islands, and other places that were to become colonial holdings, they did so as the inheritors of this theological amnesia, this Gentile forgetfulness. Their sense of power over those new peoples and spaces, coupled with their sense of pride in being the chosen people of God, created the conditions through which they believed, they earnestly believed their judgments about everything and everybody were in a real sense sanctioned by God. They imagined themselves as the people of God ordained who could make sense of the world. Imagine a calling to make sense of the world. 
as they looked out onto the new world, as they looked out onto the new world, they did two things as they looked. Their looking was decisive. First, they turned simple observations, simple observations about bodies into different ways of understanding bodies. They designated vast numbers of people and vastly different peoples through a racial scale with white being at one end and black being at the other. And everyone, everyone able to be placed somewhere in between. This was a simple observation that began to deepen and take on a life of its own. Race slowly emerged not only as a way of being seen, but also as a way of seeing and discerning different peoples. The second thing they did alongside this first thing is as they looked, as they looked out onto the world, they changed the earth. There was a time, not too long ago, when people would have never imagined themselves as a people as white or black or anything in between. There was a time not too long ago when people would have never designated themselves as peoples, black or white or something in between. And there was a time not too long ago when people would never have imagined their identities separate from the land they inhabited and the animals they lived with. The land and the animals were in them and the skin of their bodies was deeply connected to the skin of the animals and the skin of the earth. One skin, not three. Yet these early Europeans, these Christian settlers, saw the peoples separate from the land and saw the land as property to be taken and owned. That is, as private property. They looked out on the world and all they saw was a world in potential. The possibilities of development. This double looking, this double looking, at people and at the land and animals as separate, disjointed, and usable, sellable, destroyed, place-centered identity. And it created something that had never existed before, never. People, people encased, encased in something called race. People were taught to see their identities as having little or nothing to do with the land they inhabited. The land became inconsequential for who they really were. Racial beings, that's who they really were. Black or white or something somewhere in between. This history, this history of the connection of the formation of property as private property and the formation of people encased in race, this history has what has been missing from most accounts of race and its beginnings. And until we understand how the birth of race is tied to the emergence of modern private property, disconnected from peoples, tribes, and clans, we will never understand the true power of race and the racial imagination. We have been displaced from the earth, the ground, the land, 
the animals play no significant role in our self-understandings. The land no longer speaks to most of us. It is silent, dirt, private property. And we look on animals not as kin, but as pure utility, as only things for our use and our pleasure. This displacement worked its way into the way Christians imagined what it meant to share the faith with others. The world became for Christians a place you transform because it belongs to you. And the native peoples need to be transformed as well. Transformation is turned outward. It is an outward work to be wrought on the natives. Christians came to look on the native populations through what I have termed an unrelenting pedagogical imperialism. That is, the Christians saw themselves as perpetual teachers and the world as perpetual learners. They always in the position to teach, and the world always in the position to learn. This created a Christianity trapped in a mind-numbing insularity that resisted being open to being changed and transformed by those worlds and those peoples it encountered. Of course, there were Christians who pushed against this way of being and thinking. And there were indigenous peoples who became Christian, who refused to see that being Christian meant living this kind of displacement, and who understood their life with the land and the animals to be fundamental, fundamental to being Christian. These Christians constituted an important but minority report. From displacement to translation. Christianity is a translatable religion, a marvelous and important fact, as some historians have said, that transla translatability is at the heart of Christianity. But modern Christianity was caught in the middle of two kinds of translation. First, the translation of space and place into private property. And second, the translation of native worlds into the languages of the Europeans. Together, these mutually enforcing realities of translation offered up Christian identity as a citadel of conformity that drained Christian life of its deepest beauty, its stunning appeal as a site of divine love through the enjoyment of learning of, about, and with other peoples. Christianity caught in this tragic reality of translation unleashed on many indigenous peoples, evaluative visions that forever lock them in derogatory, hypercritical, obsessively judgmental perspectives on their own peoples and cultures. It introduced, it introduced a horrible idea that continues to this very moment. It introduced the idea of backwardness that primed people to believe that the only way to be mature was to grow beyond the cultural ways of their people. This tragic history of translation has a lot to do with the modern forms of Christianity in the world today. Those forms grew out of the modern history of biblical translation through which peoples 
were given the Bible in their native tongues. The legacy of biblical translation has been both a gift and a curse. It is gift, it is gift, born of the desire of many missionary translators to present the word of God in native tongue. It has, in that regard, captured part of the movement of God into the world. What I mean by this is that the divine entering into the space of the creature, the divine touch of the creature, God speaks to every people in their mother tongue. However, translation has also been a curse in that it fostered segregation and nationalism because it has inadvertently concealed the way of the translator and focused attention on the pro product of translation, that is, focused attention on the Bible. But the way of the translator is the way of the Christian. The translation of the Bible into different cultures and different worlds has meant the non-necessity of a translatable life. What do I mean by that? What do I mean by that? Our legacy of translation has meant that we do not see our bodies necessary for translation. Our bodies must be the go-betweens, between different peoples, different ways of life. Our bodies must bear within themselves multiple ways of being, multiple meanings in order to translate. The Bible is not just a product. It is a process that should show us, we who are Christian, the way of the Christian. And Christians lost sight of all that is involved in learning a language as a fundamental aspect of our faith. How do you learn a language? By committing yourself to the slow and patient task of listening and learning, yielding and submitting to the sounds of another, and if you will become fluent in a language, unless learning languages comes remarkably easy to you, if you will become fluent, at some point, the learning must encompass the loving. You must come to love the language, the way it sounds, the meaning of its words, and if that love is complete, then you will love the original speakers of that language. Love their stories, their jokes, their happiness, their sadness, their strength, their weakness, performed in that language, and still further come to learn and love the land that is signified by that language the circled earth on which that language came to life and has come to life. Such learning, not only of a language, but also of a life, is basic to the Christianity born of a God who we believe became flesh. And this brings me to the, th the third and final aspect, and that is intimacy. Intimacy has always been a troubled idea for modern Christianity shaped in colonialism. The first aspect of that trouble was the way a translated Bible enriched the piety of a people, but bound that piety in a movement toward their own. The more they meditated on the word of God in their language, the less they meditated on the word of God for them in the language of others. What would, what would it mean to fall in love with the God of another people through learning their language? 
Christianity was formed inside this fact. The movement toward God through joining another people, joining Israel, was concealed to us through reading a translated Bible. Reading the Bible never really did the deeper work that it should have done for Christians. That, it, that is, it never constantly reminded us of our movement toward another people that made us Christian in the first place. Modern Christianity, however, was formed inside an intimacy. It was the intimacy of whiteness. Whiteness emerging out of the formation of space into private property and the encasement of peoples in race. It was the intimacy that Christianity formed inside of. This was the result of the legacies of colonialism and slavery through which Africans and many other native peoples were forced to live inside the intimate spaces of white people. But this was a forced intimacy governed by domination, oppression, and assimilation. We yet live in the legacy of that forced intimacy as we continue to be conditioned by white images that define for us the true, the good, the beautiful, the noble, the human. The church and so many other religious communities have never come to grips with the painful form of forced intimacy, this painful form of forced intimacy. In response to it, many peoples have gladly formed churches where they can obtain some relief and release from forms of intimacy that they experience as non-affirming and life-draining. The church in North America and in many other places has formed itself inside what I call segregationist mentalities which means more than simply segregated churches. Christians have been shaped to believe that their sense of safety, comfort, and normalcy, safety, comfort, and normalcy can only be found when they are with people of their same race and culture. Even if the church is filled with strangers or people who barely know each other, there is yet a sense of safety, comfort, and normalcy that comes with being with your own, racially speaking. This is a deep distortion that not enough people see as a deep distortion or even accept as a problem. I don't believe that Christians are forever locked in a diseased social imagination, nor do I believe that churches are forever locked in racial segregationist mentalities. We can move forward if we commit ourselves to three simple steps, as I argue in my book. First, we must retell the story of Gentiles becoming Christian as central to understanding what it means to be Christian. We are people who have joined another people, Israel, and in this way learned of our God. We are people with Israel who have been moved by the Spirit of God toward those who we would prefer not to be with. But this is the will of God for us and a profound sign of the Spirit's presence found in the joining. Secondly, we must begin to take place and space seriously as the real site on which we live out our faith. The land, the earth, the animals should matter deeply to us, not simply because of their use value, but because they are the basis of knowing who we are and sensing our deep connection to one another. Without a deep sense of connection, there can be no real sense of belonging. And thirdly, 
we must enter into a new intentionality of life together. Real belonging for the Christian involves reaching down into the spaces where they live and touch the lives of those around them. It means paying attention to how life is configured spatially in every way from where our food comes from to where our ways of being with one another are being channeled by shopping to who we are being turned to see and not to see, who we are being told to recognize and not recognize. Recognizing that race always factors into those, into those geographic turnings. What I have not done in this presentation is to tell the stories that shape the Christian imagination, which in many ways is the heart and soul of the book. But I do want to end with the story that shaped me, the story of Mary and Ivory Jennings Sr., my parents. My father is still with me. He is 97 years old this year, and I am forever grateful for his life and his witness. My parents picked cotton in the South. That legacy of life in the dirt is the royal heritage of so many black people. To be of the dirt is to be formed of a power that one can barely articulate. Everything comes from the dirt. There in the dirt, God breathed life. How ironic that my parents also experienced so much racial oppression precisely at the site of the dirt, where cruel bosses pushed them to work from sun up to sundown, dragging heavy sacks of cotton on their sturdy backs. While the dirt was just, they knew that they would get no justice for the work they did in the dirt because every season they would be cheated out of the fair wages they deserved for honest work. The scales on which the cotton was weighed never balanced toward justice. But in those fields, in those fields, my parents' faith formed through song and hymn flung across the vastness of the land. A faith formed with each burden step down row after row of cotton, moving in time to the time-keeping singers who picked cotton alongside them. This is the faith inside of me, one with the dirt, with eyes aimed at justice, looking for a new day. Thank you. <laughs>